the Ebola crisis again occurred as, as lately as 2012 in Uganda. Between 76 and 2012, it occurred several times in the Congo. Nobody heard about it. When I say nobody, that means our policymakers and international media. <clears throat> now, after those events that were taking place in the forgotten world, in the invisible world, we had the crisis that we're all familiar with in Guinea, Guinea Conakry, in Liberia, and Sierra Leone. Initially, there was very little in the media until Ebola then crossed the African deserts, the Sahara Desert, into Europe and into the United States. It became visible. The developed world began to tremble. And then there was an emergency. It became an emergency, a crisis. Because it was no longer affecting the forgotten world, it was now affecting the real world. Why was it that Ebola has caused so much death and destruction? Lack of infrastructure, lack of investments, lack of, lack of medical services, social services in those countries, and of course, poor education of the problem. But the costs are not only high in these West African countries or where it has occurred in Europe and in the United States. It goes beyond the fact that over 20,000 people have been affected and over 8,400 deaths have occurred. But the cost of inaction there has actually affected the livelihoods <coughs> of millions of the population. Food prices have rocketed. Farmers have been unable to grow their crops because of fear and lack of medical services. Actually, apart from the medical, uh, the, the, the health hazards that have taken place, the economic situation in these three countries have worsened. A good example, in Northern Guinea, where onions and potatoes are grown by small producers, and about 25,000 tons are exported to Senegal, to the west of these countries, this time, well, at about August 2013. In August 2014, less than 2,000 tons were exported. You can imagine the crisis. Ex excessive excess production of onions and potatoes in the Putajala mountains of Mali. Prices plummeted, whereas in the Senegal, prices skyrocketed, whereas the produce was available, uh, available in, the, in, in the beginning. Gross domestic products of these countries have worsened, they have dropped. It is, ex it is recorded that about half a million of the population in these three countries today are completely having very serious food prices. But as I said, the cost does not stop in Africa. Here in the United Kingdom, Heathrow Airport is spending nine million pounds just to screen passengers. Heathrow Airport alone spent nine million pounds to screen passengers in six months. Not to talk about the cost for those health workers who are repatriated to the United Kingdom and to the US. Now what I hope that the world has learned from the Ebola crisis is that our world is one world. When something happens in a small village in Africa, maybe Timbuktu in Mali, the consequences reverberate in London, in Paris, in Washington, in New York, and in Bonn. The same thing with a crisis like the devastation that occurred in Paris 
what has happened, not just in Europe, in the US, but all over the world, about the impact of inequalities, the impact of extremism. But did Ebola have to generate headlines before the world reacted? Was it necessary for us to wait to the last minute for it to gain the headlines? There are several other problems <coughs> today. One of them is the problem of nutrition. For many years, nutrition Actually, even up to today, nutrition is considered as a health problem. And so it's left to the medical sciences, to the Ministry of Health. But we know that the problem of nutrition starts from birth. In fact, before birth, it depends on the state of nutrition of the mother, of the pregnant woman, that is transmitted to the child. So in other words, we can actually reduce the cost of nutrition interventions by starting with young girls and pregnant mothers in the developed world. I'm not referring to the other aspect of nutrition, which is obesity, that you have here in the United Kingdom or in the US or in parts of the developing world where the middle class is beginning to become richer and more economically empowered. There are around 160 children under the age of five that are stunted. One of the major impacts of malnutrition in the first thousand days of a child's life, nine months of pregnancy, and the first two years after birth. The cost is estimated by the International Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRI that the cost of reducing by 50%, 106, the, 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 uh, reducing the impact of nutrition on 160,000 young uh, infants, it will cost an investment of $15 billion for 10 years to reverse the impact of malnutrition. Whereas, you only cost a few million dollars to prevent it if interventions occur well in advance. Now, you will agree with me, ladies and gentlemen, that if in Africa, for example, let's take the African example, where agriculture or smallholder agriculture is mostly carried out by women, most of the activities are carried out by women, particularly for food crops, whose livelihoods depend on agriculture. It means that the population, it means that you are what you eat. And what you grow is what you eat. So if you want to really invest in activities that will reduce malnutrition, you invest in the rural population you invest in women. And so if you're actually talking about investment in agriculture and rural development, we are talking about investment in women, empowerment of women. And that is why there's an African proverb that when you invest in a woman, you invest in a community. When you invest in a man, you invest in an individual. <laughs> So we have to rethink development assistance. Emergency action is more expensive than prevention. And we must start in the rural areas of developing countries. Last year, the IMF economists published a study indicating that income inequality can lead to slower or less sustainable economic growth. And about the same time, the World Economic Forum, WWF, also identified inequality as the biggest threat to the global economy in the common decade. And for us at AFAD, 
inequality between the rich and the poor is equal to inequality between the urban and the rural areas. And nowhere in the world is the income gap more pronounced than the rural areas of developing countries. When you think about the fast economic growth rates in the world today, of the 10 fastest growing economies, six to, or seven of them are in Africa. It's great. Seven to 14% GDP growth rates in these countries. But have you thought about it? What is fueling this growth? This, this growth? Extractive industries, oil, gas, diamond, gold, copper. And so the middle, the middle class is growing, but the majority of the population still remains poor because this economic growth is not translated into social growth, social de de development. So there has to be a change in the policies of governments by investing massive investment in infrastructure, rural infrastructure, in roads, in energy, in people, social services, hospitals, clinics, and, in, and IT, internet. For us at IFAD, the problem is very simple. If we want to reduce poverty in the world, if we want to actually achieve the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, the problem of poverty exists in the developing world, point number one. Point number two, the poor in these countries are most, the most, most of the poor in these countries live in rural areas. So if you want to attack poverty and hunger, go to where it exists in the rural areas of the developing world. Otherwise, the increasing gap of inequality will just fuel the migration from the rural areas to the urban areas where the young people of today become highly susceptible to rhetoric and extremism. And we know the consequences. And you must realize that agriculture, no matter what scale, what, what, what is, what's the, the scale or the size, is not just producing food alone. Agriculture, small scale agriculture, <coughs> empowers people economically. It creates jobs. It enhances social cohesion in communities. It feeds people. Children are better fed. And when they are better fed with more nutritious food, they do better at school. Their cognitive ability improves and you actually are contributing to a reverse migration from the rural areas to the urban. It's reversed. You have stability, political stability, and global peace. They are all interconnected. So agriculture is not just a sector. <coughs> agriculture is a multifaceted sector that creates opportunities for populations. But it's so easy to ignore the rural areas because they do not attract votes. But that will change because the world is getting smaller and smaller. <coughs> People ask the question, but why is it that all these years we do not see the transformative effect, impact of investment in rural areas in agriculture? And I say, but it's very simple. Because you are looking for those transformative results in the urban areas. You've got to go to the rural areas. How many of you are familiar with Rwanda or Ethiopia? Now look at these two countries. In the last 15 years, what transformation has taken place? What is it? What are the ingredients? Political leadership. Visionary political leadership. Commitment at the highest level of government. The right policies. Investment in infrastructure. In the rural areas. Investment in people, particularly women. And this payoff. It's not like constructing a thousand kilometer road in six months. 
agricultural investments takes time, generations. I saw a photograph in a colleague's office in Mexico about six months ago. There were pictures that were taken in Europe, in the Netherlands, just 125 years ago. The women were barefoot. They were carrying hay on their backs or on their, on their heads with their sickle in their hands, just 125 years ago. And now you know that agriculture in the Netherlands is one of the most efficient in the world today. So it takes time. So what I'm saying about Ethiopia and Rwanda can happen in any other country. If you don't believe me, ask yourself, what was China like in the 60s and 70s? Or Brazil, 40 years ago, Brazil was dependent on food aid. Or Vietnam, 25 years ago, terrible food crisis after the Vietnamese War. Today, Vietnam is the second largest exporter of rice. So it can be done. And so it can be done in Africa as well. <coughs> because when economic development goes hand in hand with social investment, transformations begin to take place. If we are ever going to narrow the gap, or the crisis of hunger, and narrow the gap between the world's richest <coughs> and poorest citizens, we must transform rural areas that are, that are places where women and men can earn decent livings and lead dignified lives. We have seen changes of this sort taking place in Pakistan, in India, in several countries in Africa, in Latin America, and we know it pays off. And we know that we are all better, better off when we stay the course. One particular aspect I want to talk about, and I think is very important because many of you here are probably younger than 30, 25 years. I want to go, come back to the issue of youth. And I want to address particularly the African situation. Why are the Africa's, Africa's youth not going into agriculture? We ask the question. Now, if you know the image of a farmer in Africa, if you know the image of the farmer in Africa as one where it's a woman with a baby on her back and a hoe in her hand, and nobody wants to be condemned to this way of life. But we know that we are in the age of digital, digital systems. We know that with IT, a lot can happen. We know that agriculture is not just producing the, the crop or the animal. It's a, it's a system. It's a value chain system. It's a food system where from production to consumption, you have opportunities in the value chain. So you can enter into the, into the system itself, not, not by producing the food, but by transforming it, by adding value to it by information technology, by market information, by systems, by packaging. And that's what the world is. So that many of us think that if you want to buy an apple, the apple comes from the grocery store. No, it comes from the tree that is planted. You want to buy sweet corn, you go to the grocery store. But it, how does it get to the grocery store? It is grown by somebody in the farm. And so on and so forth. You want to buy a kilogram of pork or beef, <coughs> Where does it come from? Somebody raises the cattle. So there are opportunities in the food system, the food chain, to get into agricultural businesses. But governments must write the right policies that encourage youth to go into agriculture. The world today has the largest population of young people between the ages of 14 and 25. In Africa, it's about 200 million and growing, 10 million every year. In India alone, 11 million every year added to the workforce, into the, work, the job market. Now with about 35% unemployment rate in Africa, you can imagine what that is. 35% of 200 million is 70 million unemployed youth. 
across the continent. And in India in particular, it's much higher. So we are looking at a situation where the youth are going to become restive, no jobs, and governments cannot provide jobs for everybody. It's impossible. So there are opportunities to go into businesses. And migrating to the urban areas has a limit. All urban cities have a limit, a finite capacity, a finite current capacity. And we have to look at how the rural space can become an attractive environment for people to make a living. Now, in order not to overshoot my time, let me see if I can share with you some of the things I have learned through my own experiences. What I consider as things that must change for us to make a difference. And this is to ensure that agricultural system leads to economic growth and social development. The first of them, I think I may have mentioned, is that development is not what we do for people. Development is what people do for themselves. If you are interested in going into development, please don't go with the mentality that you're going to transform people. Go with the mentality that they must transform themselves. They must move out of poverty. But what our job is, is to catalyze the process, is to support, is to incentivize, is to assist. And when they take ownership of the process, then the transformation occurs. You can never impose development on anyone, least of all poor people, because they have their dignity and they're not voting for handouts. That's my lesson number one. Lesson number two, and that's for the development sector. We must measure the impact of our investment, not by the size of the investment, but by the outcome of that investment. A recent discussion I think I saw in the OECD is trying to see how they can increase the perception of the ODA, Overseas Development Assistance, is increasing over time. And they want now to look at how they can take loans, concessional loans, to be included into the ODA envelope so that it will look big. So we look at the size of investment in development in terms of how much money. That has to change. We should measure it in terms of the results, in terms of the number of people reached, in terms of the number of people removed out of poverty, in terms of how many children now go to school in the remotest areas of the world in terms of how many of uh, the percentage reduction in stunting in those countries, and so on and so forth. And the third one I'd like to talk about is, of course, less tangible. It is one of perception. And I just referred to that a, a while ago. And that is to do with our investment in young people. Now, I wonder how many of you come have come to Warwick with a background in agriculture, in farming, livestock, crops. One, two. Well, you see what I mean. As I said, the young people today are alienated from farming, at least in the developed world, and I told you why. But the point is that if you look at the population of the farming community anywhere in the world, They are mostly people in their 50s and above. Who is going to feed the world in 2030? That's 15 years from now. These farmers are going to be 65 and above. They won't be farming anymore. It's you, you guys here. <laughs> it won't be me either. <laughs> so, governments <laughs> must do everything they can to invest in the youth. Here at the United Kingdom, in Europe as well as in the developing world because the future is in your hands and we need bright, bright minds with innovation that are able to take risks and I will consider that the future 
of the neighboring countries in the developing world is as important as your future here in the United Kingdom. So let me leave you with one final thought. Why should people in the cities care for what happens in the countryside? Very simple. Because without the countryside, you have no cities. It's as simple as that. Your food comes from the countryside. Have you seen apples grown in London? <laughs> simple. Food comes from rural areas. Your clean air comes from rural space. Not here. Not in industrial zones. The clean air, if you want to balance the clean air in the environment, is your rural space. So we've got to keep investing in the rural space. So we need rural areas to grow our food and to maintain a healthy environment. We need successful rural economies so that there's a flow of goods, services, and money between rural and urban areas. If we continue to forget the rural space, we'll experience exactly the same thing with Ebola. In no time, the problems there will become our problems. It will be too late. And the cost of inaction is highly, highly much higher than the cost of prevention. Cities have finite capacities. They cannot provide good jobs for everybody, nor housing and sanitation for every, everyone. And urbanization does not necessarily translate into influence. And I hope that for those parts of the world where development is still a process that is going on, we do not invest entirely in urban development. You know, many people go and study urban develop, development. Hardly anybody thinks of rural development, but that must change. Now, Professor Muthi, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I have said enough to stimulate your senses, as they say, and I will have a stimulating discussion for the next 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes. Thank you very much.